This episode is brought to you in part by UC Irvine's Executive Master's Program for Human-Computer Interaction and Design. As a user experience professional, UCI's hybrid program will allow you to maintain your job while pursuing the master's degree that will propel your career forward. Stay tuned to learn more about this exciting program. Find your place in a safe, caring, generous, and inspiring community of UXers who are passionate about fighting for the users and making a difference in this world through great design. Try User Defenders Community free for seven days at community.userdefenders.com. More to come. Have an attitude of gratitude that you say, my plate is full. Let me go and fight another war. Let me go and make my life better. Not dwelling in that victimhood that we live in a slum was probably the biggest learning of my life. You're still in a much better position than a lot of people. Welcome to the User Defenders Podcast, where we interview UX superheroes who fight for the users in order to inspire and equip you to do the same. And now, here's your host, Jason Ogle. Greetings, user defenders. Welcome to this incredibly inspiring and moving season finale. I'm your host, Jason Ogle. You know how they say I've saved the best for last? Well, believe me when I say I have saved the best for last. I also say on this episode and mean it that if you're not motivated, inspired, and moved by the end, check your pulse because you may not be alive. Shahina Atarwala was born in the slums of Mumbai and had to overcome tremendous adversity and obstacles in order Order to plow her path to success in not only the field of UX but especially in life to become a major contributor and force for good for humanity. Her experiences have given her a much deeper and greater insight into the field of design and personal growth, particularly in the areas of grit, growth mindset, innovation, and empathy. In other words, Shahina is the epitome of what this show is all about. There's so much to glean and take to heart in this episode. All the mentioned links, transcript, and Eli Jorgensen's complete superhero artwork can be found on the show notes page at userdefenders.com slash 070. Now please enjoy this powerful, enlightening, and super inspiring season finale with Shahina Atarwala. I am delighted to welcome to the show Shahina Atarwala. Did I say that right, Shahina? Yes, you did. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. I usually ask that before, but I we're doing this live like Bill O'Reilly. So, okay. So I, I usually, Defenders, as you know, I usually will take a, a few moments in the beginning to sort of touch on some bio points. I used to read the entire thing word for word. And then Andy Bud's like, that sounds kind of scripted. And so I started doing like bullet points. And the funny, the thing here about with Shahina is... I feel like a lot of what we're going to talk about today is her story. And so in, in for the sake of not spoiling what she's going to really dive deep into, I'm just going to tell you that Shahina is a UX design manager at Zoomcar, and that's India's first self-driving platform. That sounds fascinating. I hope we get to talk about that a little bit as well. That's all I'm going to tell you. That's That's all you get. That's the tweet. So (laughs) here we go. I'm going to say officially, Shahina, welcome to User Defenders. I am super excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm equally excited and I'm really looking forward for this chat today. You have a fascinating story. I I want to jump right in and just let you tell us your story. And I, I basically just want to kind of preface this with, you know, take us back to your childhood. You know, what, tell us what it was like growing up in the slums of Mumbai and, and what your family life was like. Because I know that's a really vital part of where you are now as, as a UX designer and in the journey that you've been on for how long have you been on the journey of becoming, of being a designer and now a design leader? It's almost uh, 10 years now. Okay, wow. So take us back. I, I really I really want to start from the beginning here. I think it's critical to our conversation. Yeah. So Jason, uh, I was born in a village in Uttar Pradesh, which is in North India. And uh, my father was a, a hawker here in Bombay, in Dharavi. He used to sell uh, uh, perfume 
and uh, roam around and uh, sell perfumes. And uh, it so happened that I had to move to Bombay uh, with my dad and uh, he was living here with his brother. It was a family of like around after I moved uh, here, it was a family of around like um, 15 odd people in like a 10 by 20 house. <laughs> and, wow. uh, you know, the house was made up of like, you know, uh, like a shanty, uh, wooden uh, wood and uh, uh, sort of steel uh, roof and uh, yeah I mean uh, at that point uh, that was uh, <laughs> I don't know how to, how to put it but uh, when I moved here that time we did not even have like water in our house uh, my mom used to go out and fetch water she's I, the only memory of my childhood of hers is that either she's cooking cleaning or either washing clothes or going to fill water and uh, th- this is exactly like how my life was back then when I moved here as a child. I'm American. I feel like I can't identify with that challenge. Like I grew up, I grew up in a pretty small house and my dad was very successful in his work. There's many who have humble, a humble beginning. There's some certainly who are born with a silver spoon in their mouth and they never, they, all they ever know is kind of privilege and, and just kind of whatever they want they can have. But I just feel like a lot of us have humble beginnings And you certainly like, I mean, the small house I grew up with one bathroom and two siblings and two parents like that was hard to even. But I had Mm -hmm. I had plumbing. I had, you know, it's like it's those things, those little things. And I just I'm just curious, like, how did that what did that do to your your mentality? Like, what was that like as a kid? Did you even really know the difference as a kid? That was just just, because as kids like they're so you're so resilient, right, as a child. And you Mm -hmm. just kind of you just accept your surroundings and you don't really know any different. Like, did you know that there was something different or lacking about your upbringing or your environment? You're absolutely right, Jason. Back then, I did not know that there's a better world out there. So for me, that was the best. And uh, honestly, I was okay with all of that, right? Uh, um, Whether it's, uh, you know, if I'm going out, we did not have a toilet growing up. So there was a public toilet. I mean, and it was extremely, extremely filthy. There were human feces all around. And I will have to uh, literally take a bucket of water from my house, walk it up till there, and then in dark, uh, filthy place. I had to go but I mean when you're a child there are women who ask you to just go out and defecate on the garbage because it's literally like slums it's literally like growing in the garbage and when you're out there defecating there are um, you know boys and men who are trying to molest you if tease you do Mm. gestures at you Uh, so it's not easy growing up but uh, one of the things that I realized was when I was going to school um, uh, I, I faced um, you know, I was I used to really look forward going to school because I got access to clean toilet. And uh, that wow. was amazing. You know, I was like, wow, there's something. So that's 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 an achievement for me, probably at that age. And I was like, no, I don't want to carry the bucket and go. It's so heavy. And those ladies, uh, other adult ladies ask me to go outside and, you know, men molest me. And then so uh, in school, I used to really, really look forward to it. And it was very peaceful. Um so, yeah, uh, you know, I, I just uh, I was I did have access to something better. And whenever I did, I knew that this is what I wanted in the future. I would want to have a clean toilet. That was pr- probably my ambition back then as a child. Wow. I'm I'm just humbled by what you shared. I'm, I am totally humbled. So we're going to dive even deeper here. I know I, I read your bio. I read some of the information that you sent me and you grew up in India and the culture tends to be somewhat repressive to women. Would that be accurate? Is that an accurate statement? I would probably just talk about myself and what I have seen. Uh, it is in most part it is especially from uh, where i come in north india it's very very repressive uh, i mean uh, forget about talking about other women myself you know being in bombay and the situation that i was living in i still felt that it is it is still better than living in a village because out there i would have probably been married by now having five kids and washing utensils uh, but uh, here at least I had basic education but uh, growing up my father wanted me to get married after my 10th grade which is like probably at the age of 15 and uh, that's something that did not go down well with me and uh, we started having fallouts um, as a child I was very rebellious so I used to be beaten up almost every day 
there's something that i knew what i did not want i did not like people abusing me i did not like people beating me and uh, for all i knew this was just uh, getting magnified day by day in the life that i was having and uh, uh, you know my dad was absolutely against my education but uh, i i i sort of you know after a lot of beating and uh, constant uh, abuses i had a conversation with him i i told him one day that uh, you know uh, you're trying to curb my education you want me to get married and uh, i don't even know who the person is and what kind of a man he is going to be but if you're going to curb my education i won't be able to achieve anything in life you know if tomorrow i if i have a problem in life i'll be so dependent on other people and you won't be there to protect me so you have to at least empower me to uh you know study and make something out of my life i am not doing anything wrong i'm not doing anything that will hurt you so you have to give me that freedom because you're not going to be there with me uh in my entire life all the time so i knew that my parents also did not know any better they themselves were abused they themselves came from a village uh, and they did not know any better right so what else can i expect more from them i mean that that i still remember that night when i went to him and i spoke to him this because i was ready to leave my house i packed my bags in a piece of cloth how old were you oh, i was around oh. um uh, 16 <laughs> okay Yeah and I told him that I'm leaving uh, this life that I have here in the slums it's not any great I can always go and sleep on the roads uh, I'm very resilient like that so I'm not afraid to lose anything because at this point I have nothing right um, so somewhere I think he understood what what I was meaning to so he started sort of uh, you know letting me go ahead and uh, you know study at least and uh, I mean that 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 he didn't completely support it but at least he was not interfering too much after that. What were some of the pivotal aha moments for you to when you just said, you know, this culture that I'm growing up with which is sacred, I know, the fact that it was kind of upsetting to your dad that you wanted to get an education, you wanted to make a path for yourself that really did break tradition. What was that like? What was the pivotal like aha moment for you that made you do that? You know Jason uh growing up like I said I I saw my mother being beaten up and uh I was surrounded by a lot of women right whether it's in my village or slums and I used to hear them talk a lot right uh the the one of the essence of each conversation would lie around oh my husband did this oh my husband did that but what can we do we can't do anything right this is our fate this is uh, what women are made for cooking cleaning giving giving birth to children and uh, and i realized that why is it that they are so helpless what is it you know and constantly talking with my mother about this uh, even though she has no exposure about the outside world she never had any friends but she is very revolutionary in her thinking right so one fine day when i was talking to her about a problem and uh, she told me that if i was you right if i was you and i was educated i would move out she's like i don't have education i don't have parents who will accept me back and uh, so here it is that's why i'm cooking and cleaning in your house that was a conversation that i had as a woman to woman not as a mother to daughter right and that really sh- made me take courageous steps as well though she was also not very supportive but just the fact that when she became neutral and she spoke as a woman the thoughts were so moving now that you have really found a lot of success in a field that you love and that you're so passionate about and you've worked obviously very hard to get where you are now and obviously overcome a lot of obstacles more than many of us listening would ever be able to identify with i'm curious what's your relationship like with your family now i guess maybe with your dad it seemed like did you and your dad bump heads the most it seems like your mom had some empathy and and understanding of what you were trying to do tell me about that what's that like now that you've achieved this success and you've plowed your own path you know uh, my father he and i were like enemies like i 
at some point i wished he was dead you know like you know yeah. how teenagers are they go to their bed and that like i don't have freedom i wish they just die but uh, in the middle of the nights you know when you have no one to talk to you like try and figure out like see i knew that violence or um, aggression won't work here i wanted to find a middle way where they also grow with me right because eventually my success would be nothing if it's just an individualistic um, goal because i knew that they love me and whenever parents they oppress you it is also coming out from a place of fear because they knew what kind of a place we were living in they knew that uh, i was getting molested right when i'm going to school there are men who are constantly passing comments and uh, so they wanted to protect me from all that abuse and sexual molestation that's happening as well so they probably you know didn't want me to be exposed to that side of the world where i get freedom and at any point i'm alone or mistreated but now my relationship with my dad is very cordial we've learned to coexist we are very empathetic which towards each other and uh, i understood that they don't they didn't know any better at that point and they also understood now that you know what i thought the decisions that i took regarding my education they were best and now both my parents um, they are actually um, advocating for girl child education in our extended families and our villages and our slums so even if wow. uh, you know parents of girls they don't want their female child to get educated but they my parents at least say that teach her some life skills whether it's um, stitching painting computer something that will help her be independent in some way and a lot of girls have uh, been educated and learned skills and because i have gone ahead and done so much other parents feel that you know oh it's okay if she can do it our daughter can do it too and that uh, that's immensely fulfilling for me because i have not just done things for myself but when i look back i'm i feel so humbled and happy that you know my journey has not just been about me it's been about more women and more children that are being influenced and inspired that's so so awesome it's inspiring to hear that and i it feels like there was like a 180 that sort of happened with your folks along this journey and and you were a big part of that like them watching you succeed and watching your tenacity and your curiosity and your drive I, that's inspiring i mean we're just getting started here but i'm like i'm pumped up already so i i'm curious about design like how does design enter your journey how did you find design when i was in school i wasn't a very good student right i was um, english wasn't my first language hindi was so uh, whenever i went to school I, it was so difficult for me to decipher what the teacher is actually talking uh, she used to speak fast and so i felt so left out right and because of my grades and uh, poor english uh, i didn't have really many girls who were fond of me who wanted to be friends with me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah but um uh then one fine day in the uh, in the late 90s early 2000 i guess um that in my school there was a computer course that was started and uh i overconfidently i said i'm going to learn computer i want to learn computer even though my grades are so bad but there was something in me that i said i want to learn and i filled the form and i said yeah let's do this and the teacher rejected my form and she put me in a needlework class uh stitching really? class and uh, i yeah i i went to the teacher i said ma'am i asked for computers i don't want to go in that needle work because i already know that i already do all of this at home right like uh, i'm already a, a half mother at home so taking care of my siblings i don't want to i want to learn this this is what i need she's like no no your grades are not good and everything so that was the biggest letdown at that point right like i was so furious and every time that um, needlework period used to go i used to first go to the computer class see all the girls working and touching the computer and i was like wow this is magic like i know i need this magic in my life mm-hmm. and uh, i was i was uh, creative as well i used to draw paint i loved doing that in school i realized that i was good at it and um, so you know uh, there was a little course that got started in my area around and a friend was talking about it and i said yes this is what i need in my life right now 
and uh, there were always these aha moments right like god is guiding me like china now go there so i said yeah yeah i need this and then i went to dad and i said okay listen this is a course and i want to do it i got thrashing of my life <laughs> <laughs> i was like do whatever i need to do this now you tell me what you want if you want me to do something so that i get that so there was a bargain that started so he's like okay you will take your brother and then you will uh, you know cover yourself completely and x y z i said i'll do everything what you want you want me to take an army of men i'm ready to do that and so i joined the course and uh, you know with a lot of resistance but uh, and uh, there was no looking back then you know i used to just spend entire day in the class in in you know there uh, in my uh, computer classes uh, my i then in my college i used to finish my college i used to not even go home i used to just go to the computer class because then there was internet i think internet was the best thing that happened to me <laughs> after my school i said you are my father you are my mother because i could <laughs> learn so much from it right like day and night i was just always there so and there was no looking back then i started doing small time projects freelancing uh, you know doing uh, uh, projects for my college for different other colleges uh, and you know starting making a little money here and there and collecting money for buying a computer then you know like every rupee every 10 rupee i used to walk back home i used to not even take a bus so um, i used to walk back home not have snacks in the college and just save that money because i knew my father is definitely not going to buy and he said a no straight we didn't have the, that much right? right um so i said it's okay i'll i'll do something and I, and i bought my computer <laughs> i bought that then i bought a uh, macbook that i bought an imac like i didn't hesitate for once that you know i don't know what i'm going to do but i just did that like there was no looking back after it wow that's so inspiring what was driving you the whole time that you were doing this like what was it yeah i i, I still keep thinking i think i just wanted to get out of that and i knew that i will get out of it because once i've seen a life that's better once i've seen that it is possible you know adversities are there but you can have a life that you want that you dream of and it is possible and i knew that i was different and i just i was and i was uh, you know unapologetic about it you know i didn't i didn't conform to the views that i am a girl and i can't do this because i've already seen that right there was nothing new that i was giving to myself if i was just going to adapt whatever is ready made uh, given to me you know so i i knew that i didn't want that life that's something that i was very sure from uh, very early on in my life if someone would abuse me i knew i didn't want to be abused what else did i want in return i didn't know but i knew that i didn't want this treatment or this life so i think that 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 whole thing of just getting out of it was something you know it's like a survival instinct that either you do or die that that's that's how it was there's so many things i want to ask you and i'm just i just really am i'm on this journey with you shahina and like i just feel like you're taking me to places that i i could not have gone gotten to on my own like you i just appreciate so much your transparency and your vulnerability and and telling your story there's it's it's deep and it's it's powerful how did growing up in the slums of mumbai with really nothing and so many obstacles like how did that influence you as a human centered designer like what did that do for you now in your profession that you can look back and go wow that's why i do this or that's why i do that right i think uh, you know growing back with very limited resources you always try to optimize and uh, you know your problem solving skills like just one of the very few examples i would give you is um, the bucket uh, the toilet bucket that i was talking to you about when i used to go uh, an yeah. open bucket right an open bucket is something when we used to take it used to hurt our hands um, and by the time we reached the public toilet half of the water would have been spilled you try taking that and half of the water would be spilled because you're walking a long distance you're tired you're keeping that again so um what we did was we took an oil container an oil container has a much better grip uh something that we get here in india so uh at the um where the cap of the container is you uh, heat the knife and you cut it out very small and then you remove that and then you use it as a bucket it's not completely it's just it just has like a small rounded uh, cut opening and then you use it for that 
and that actually does not let your hand get tired it's even more uh, robust when you uh, you're picking it up and helps you uh, walk a long distance now that is something i as a young girl or uh, living anywhere i didn't need too much of thinking but had it not been for the constraints of resources um, i would not have been able to develop that idea right like something so small and in every aspect of life we are constantly trying to optimize over there that's one thing you know trying to understand the problem that we have whether it's a leaking roof whether it is uh, water entering your house during the monsoons how do you take it out because we don't have any openings so what you do is you use little plates you use whatever you know vessels you have and you remove it uh, so mm-hmm. these kind of constant uh, you know problem solving during your living there it helps you become a very frugal liver you know you're like living life very frugally and when you are frugal you try to iterate quickly so that you optimize for your uh, as you put it in today's world your best mvp and quickly test it and iterate it uh, that that's exactly what i think a lot of people like me uh, do it in in villages especially you know there's a lot of frugal living that happens and i think that's the hub of innovation when you try and use things which you already have for a purpose more than one that's when you start learning to solve multiple problems with just a few solutions that are available Many UX professionals want a master's degree, but they don't want to move or pause their careers to do it. Thanks to UC Irvine's one-of-a-kind program, as a user experience professional, you can receive a world-class master's degree without quitting your job, commuting, or moving. UCI blends in-person learning with the flexibility of online distance education in a top-ranked one-year program. UCI's alumni become distinguished UX designers, researchers, and strategists all over the world. When you're ready to elevate your user experience or design career, UCI's master's program for HCI and design will give you just the lift you need. Learn more about this amazing program at userdefenders.com slash UCI. That's userdefenders.com slash UCI. That makes so much sense to me and how you explain that because what better way to become a really good problem solver than to have like a lot of problems that you have to solve, right? Like what better yeah. way to just flip that switch in your mind? And I'm I'm sure it's not just something you flip. It's something that you become, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's always like first principles right there, whether it's cooking, cleaning, uh, going out to travel, anything it is. You're constantly thinking about the resources first and then the solution. I have this resource. How can I make the best use for it to build a solution? It's as simple as that. That is the root of what we do, Defenders. We are problem solvers at the core. It ties into fighting for the users, which is a big message. That's the banner that I wave here at the show. We fight for the users like Tron. But it also lends itself to business because without a business, we're hobbyists. That's the reality. We, without a business, without a cause, without something sustainable, we are, we're still doing good. We're just maybe not doing good on the scale that we would like to to do and that's okay too right like i say if you want to change the world change the world for one person at a time that's how you do it you're showing us that we can all be innovative where you are today and where you've come to as a result of a really difficult journey you know my hat is tipped to you my heart Mm -hmm. is like really full for you in this journey you've been on but i think the message here defenders is we're all on different journeys We all come from different environments. We all have a different upbringing. But the reality is, is that we can all do this. We can all innovate and we can all become problem solvers if we truly desire. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Like, you know, Jason, even today online, when I go uh, and uh, see some of the innovations that people are coming up with, like, for example, uh, there's this innovation recently that I saw that, you know, when you sit on your uh, pot, toilet pot, there's Mm -hmm. a table, there's a small tool that people have designed where you put it under the pot and you put so that, you know, there can be a squatting position on the pot and I was like why can't people just use a bucket it's already existing right you're trying to fool people in the name of innovation when something already can be used for multiple things that's not innovation it's just bullshit (laughs) right 
you you yourself can make so many things at home see the the as designers it's so important to understand the problem first because we delve into solutions so fast that we forget about the problem we feel that just being very superficial and aesthetic about the solution will actually make you a problem solver no if if you want your solutions to be accepted by the masses uh, by uh, by scale if you want to impact millions of life the billion of life then you have to go uh, to the root of the problem and understand that you know that's exactly what uh, google is trying to do with the next billion project right they're trying to bring billions of the next billion people onto a, a tech platform which is which is rev- going to revolutionize the way people use technology and that's what is my vision right for myself as well because i when i'm designing when i'm uh, coming up with solutions when i'm solving problem i don't look at it like a one off thing i look at it that how impactful it's going to be right is this the best way is this the most scalable way right that's exactly what i think and i think that sort of thinking really uh, is important if you want to scale at a level where you impact millions of people because as a designer you don't know who's using your design you don't know how many people so you might as well put your best shot forward you know with a lot of scientific thinking also which is involved in it there's a quote I really like a lot about innovation. An innovator is not someone who creates something out of nothing. An innovator is someone who wakes up to the constraints caused by false assumptions and breaks out of them. Wow, I'm hearing that for the first time, actually. <laughs> Isn't that great? I'm going to I, use I, it somewhere. I'm going to copy it somewhere, Jason. Yeah, do it, do it. This is being recorded, thankfully. So... <laughs> But I just really like that a lot because I think that a lot of us really confuse what innovation truly means. And as designers, we need to be careful because innovation is not about doing something nobody's ever done before. It's not. It's actually quite the opposite. It's about finding something that exists, something that people do already, that people use, and finding a new way to make that better, to make that a better experience. Steve Jobs did that with iPhone. Steve Jobs and yeah, Apple computer right. did that with iPhone. We did not know we needed a phone that played music, that accessed the internet, that did text messaging. We didn't know we needed that. And now we can't live without the stinking thing. Some of us put it under our pillows at night. We love it so much, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I I think it's changing behaviors, right? Your innovation should not be just there somewhere kept. It has to change your behavior. You need to evolve with it. So you're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And then, you know, even even just some of the examples that you're mentioning about a toilet. It's like there's just a toilet. All a toilet really is is a bucket that looks better, that looks more attractive. than. (laughs) (laughs) That's all it is, folks. And, you know, some fancy <laughs> pipes underneath that are hidden, you know, but that's the magic. That's the magic of design of the toilet. It's all the stuff you don't see underneath. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, right? I, I work a lot in the sanitation space also, right, Jason? Yeah, so tell us about My that. conversation at some point, it, it just involves toilets for some reason. Thanks for like, clarifying what, that. Uh, I... <laughs> Yeah, other people will like constantly think that she's she's so obsessed with poop. <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter, Shahina. No. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Just, oh, you do? Oh, funny. I thought I would be the innovator yeah. around that saying for you. No. Yeah, I just I just wanted the people, you know, the defenders to understand where my thought process is coming from because I think whenever you are passionate about something, there is a history attached to it, you know, there is a shared value that you have attached to it and that's why it becomes so close to your heart that you want to make something out of it. Like no matter who that person is, you know, uh, people who are innovating things, people who are solving problems, at some point they must have been touched by that problem and that's why they pick it up to solve it. So you have legal skills is what I heard and is what I read in your bio. You have some legal skills. Can you tell us about that and what that's done for you to help you make you a better designer? Yes, I I studied um, law as well and I do paralegal services, which means that I uh, help people 
especially women again coming back to that mm. who do not have access um, uh, to legal uh, you know consulting wow. so i do let them know that what is the best thing that they can do in this situation uh, also like in near future you know i i want to i i'm very socially active in the sense uh, i do a lot of social activism i work in hygiene sanitation space uh, as a social worker and uh, taking that cause forward maybe in my 40s uh, i would uh, want to start my own enterprise social enterprise where i solve these kind of problems at a very large scale what i do right now is at a very small scale but uh, that's why i studied law because it always helps to have that uh, as a skill and uh, to take your cause forward but what i understood when i was studying law as well is that even the legal policies the laws they are designed right uh, they're designed for people like we design products for people users right yeah. the legal policies are also designed for people keeping the problem eventual problem that it's going to solve in mind and uh, it is tested vetted also you know by multiple stakeholders which could be policy makers which could be experts in those fields whether it's a domestic abuse law whether it is a, an IT act anything So when I was going through and studying these three years, they made me realize that everything is designed. It is not mm. just design that we see, but even designs that we don't see, whether it affects our behavior, whether it affects affects our life. Every single thing is designed on this planet. Yeah, I think God must be a designer. I fully agree. <laughs> Genesis 1-1, very first scripture, in the beginning, God created. Yes, absolutely, Jason. Sorry, evolutionists, I just don't see enough evidence that all of a sudden there was perfect order in design out of an explosion. And feel free to argue <laughs> with me, argue with me uh, on Twitter about that if you want. But yeah, I fully agree with you. There's way too much design in this world for there not to be a designer for everything, including our DNA and including this universe. Tell me about so legal skills and frugal living. Like what has that done for you in your empathy and compassion for fellow humans as a human-centered designer? How has that helped you? You know, like my empathy, I think I always tell this to people when they talk about empathy, you know, uh, that your empathy begins at home mm. and your empathy begins with the people you work with closely. Forget about the users. You're a UX designer later. First try and empathize with the tech tech guy that you're working with, the product manager you're working with, the business head you're working with. Because most so many times I see our fellow designers, they're so bullish and strong headed that no, we are only going to represent users. We are Yes, that's all cool, but these people are also your teammates who are trying to solve the same problem. Maybe their approach is different. So understand why they're behaving that way, right? Yeah. Because once you do that, they will become your teammates. They will actually take your cause forward. You will have more people who will speak your language. And being a designer is also about selling your vision, not just mm. selling your design. Because once you've sold a vision, you have sold an entire product right so how do you sell that vision of your design not just two or three screens but your vision when you talk in a larger context people understand people relate to stories they don't relate to um, uh, you know one or two screens or this button or that font they relate to stories how are you conveying that story mm. that's so important like you spoke about compassion right yeah. uh, you know a couple of years back i i uh, my mother and i we con we were talking uh, she and i have a lot of conversations about how this world can be a better place now she and i were having a conversation about this family in up in uttar pradesh a very poor family of uh, three four girls and a mother living they did not have a toilet in their house so in villages what happens is these girls these women they have to go in the fields to ease themselves and when the crops are there in the field it's okay you know they can just sit somewhere but when the crops are harvested it's so difficult because then it's land then they have to go and find a tree and uh, it exposes them to a lot of uh, molestation eve teasing or even rape sometimes oh, and my heart broke when i was hearing that and i said ma I i'll try and do something i constantly do i keep doing this and this was one of the projects that i took up i actually crowdfunded a toilet to build in their home i gathered people i sent some funds collected funds uh, and some i asked one of my relatives in the village to go to that village to build it for them and you know i made an entire project and a case study out of it and it was published in the united nations uh, website as well wow. so uh yeah 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 i i think things are possible it's it's 
you if you desire to do something if you have compassion empathy uh, for your fellow human beings it's only then can you solve the problem i can't be an arrogant designer and still say i'm empathetic towards my users that's never going to happen you're just fooling yourselves right by just learning a few tools you cannot say you're empathetic just because you built a screen there's much more deeper connection to it right so these kind of things and and i feel compassion should not just be in design it's everywhere and it just it's for me it happens to be design this episode is also made possible by something super cool an alternative to the dot com domain name it's the drum roll please dot design domain name try saying that five times fast so if you're a designer and i know you are and you've thought of a sweet name for your website that just isn't available under dot com check out dot design chances are the perfect domain name you want is waiting for you on a bearskin rug okay maybe not the rug but wouldn't that be great head to userdefenders.com slash pork bun now and use coupon code defenders on the checkout page to get literally a free year of a dot design domain name bundled with free email hosting, who is privacy, and even SSL certs. Don't wait. Grab your dot .design domain name now before someone else does. Go to userdefenders.com slash porkbun now and use coupon code DEFENDERS. I, I'm a big fan of empathy. I feel like any life-changing product or service, anything designed, really, if, it, if their empathy isn't at the core of it, it's just not going to be as effective as it could be. Because you're not considering the people using what you're creating. You're not thinking about them. You're not talking to them, right? Like some people say, if you're not talking to users, it's not user experience. So I, I'm a big fan of empathy for so many reasons, beyond even beyond design. It's just, I think it's just one of the, the unique signifiers, to use a Don Norman uh, quote there, a signifier of us as humans. I, I'm a huge fan. I, I love that story. And you mentioned stories. And that's another reason why I'm so glad you're on the show, Shahina, is because I really believe that stories are what really stick with us. That that helps us learn the best is when we hear stories and, and we can kind of tie it into a message or a takeaway, right? And so that's that's really, I'm, I'm a huge fan of you in that way, that you have so many stories to tell, you have so much to offer and helping others. I want to kind of talk about your experience you have with Don Norman, because that was a really special, like, I think you spent like a full day with him, like he was consulting with yeah. you, he was doing a, a talk out there. I don't want to, I, I guess I'll let you tell the story because you were there. <laughs> So I want to hear yeah. about that so, story. <laughs> yeah, actually, I I volunteer for this organization called iSpirit. is a not it is a not for profit organization, and I offer my user experience skills uh, at a, at a pro bono basis. And he was down here, um, uh, you know, uh, talking with us uh, members of iSpirit as well about uh, how we can you know solve a human problem in India and uh, looking at the problems at a very uh, user centric approach. And um, I, I had a, an entire day with him where I spoke to him about how I'm passionate about education, right? Like I told him one of my stories about how I explained solar system to my mother, you know, because she doesn't understand what Jupiter, Pluto is. What is solar system? For these people to uh, understand that sun is, you know, the earth is round is a big deal. So... Uh, you know, uh, so when I came from school and I had to explain it to her how I did that, and I was I was telling him the story that I explained to her in Hindi that how the sun is in the center, the earth is round, earth has water. Uh, if you go to, you know, say, for example, U.S., it's night there uh, and it's day in India because uh, of the rotation etc etc right how to break that information in chunks that it's chewable for her you know that she can understand because hey i know that i understand but does she also understand and if i want to coexist with her i have to share knowledge with her so that we can have conversations and that's how i think equality in this world will ever exist 
that we have to share knowledge. We have to bring the person who does not have that knowledge at our our path, right? So I explained to her in Hindi, and he just uh, he he got so excited about that because he himself is a person who is extremely passionate about education, and he totally believed in my story. And he, when he was giving an official talk uh, later to the designers that day, and he actually used that example, and I was like, yes, my life is successful now that Don has used my example. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Like I'm so happy, right? I was in so much awe that day because you know I I think uh, the fact that he also believes in education in a very different way because I don't think people who do not have uh, access to science can now go to class one and study. But there are certain basics that we can definitely expose them to so that they start being critical thinkers, right? Not believe in the stupid theory of Earth is flat. <laughs> For example, people from my village. People from my village, when they come and see a sea, right, an ocean, they think it's a big lake. Oh my goodness! Yeah, like that. That's how it is. Yeah. So we just need to at least provide people with basic critical thinking tools, and this being one of them, that science is so so important. Not, not that I'm an expert, but just the fact that we share that same value helped us, uh, you know, speak in conversation. Like he actually squatted in front of like 200 odd top notch designers in India and said, "See, the culture here is that Indians can squat and I can't." He was so so candid, and wow. I love that fact that I was like, "Hey, if." If he's Don Norman and he is not ashamed to squat in front of so many people and talk about a relevant user behavior. I am nobody to be ashamed of talking about my life story because I know that if he would not have done one or two things, I would not have probably understood what he's trying to talk to us. And being vulnerable and being candid and open and honest in an interview or talk is so so important because I feel it's 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 being true to your audience. Like you know, every defender who's hearing this right now, it it will be unfair to them if I wasn't myself right here. Amen, sister. That's so cool. So one of the things that Don mentioned, and I think it might have even been a part of your conversation with him that day, was the importance of curiosity for designers. Not just importance, it is critical for designers to have curiosity. So what I'm wondering, and obviously you're a very curious person, and that's, I believe, one of the things that's propelled you so far, is being so curious, and you have some funny things in your bio about, like, Asking so many questions. Well, why is it this way? Why is my brother this way? Or why is, you know, why? Yeah. And those are good things to ask. Why? Right? Like Simon Sinek's like, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And I think asking why is another good reason for that. So I'm curious not to, you know, no pun intended, maybe pun intended. Sure. I'm curious. Is it possible to teach curiosity? And what do you think about it? If so, how? How do you teach curiosity? to other people especially designers it's totally possible to teach curiosity you know like um, i love talking to children oh, i yes. absolutely love because <laughs> i think it's amazing to talk to them you know i just call any random kid as like hi what do you study i study so and so why are you studying that oh my parents put me in that class but why are you doing it then do you enjoy it like these kind of questions and i make them think you know, and then they just roll their eyes like, why is she talking to me like this? You know, is she mad? Does she have nothing better to do? But my point is that kids start thinking. They will start thinking. You know, if you tell them, be curious, they're not going to be curious. You have to show what curiosity is. If you're curious in knowing about what they want or what they are excited about, they'll be like, oh my God, she's excited. So I need to get involved in this, right? They feel like equal participants as opposed to someone who's trying to uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, impose their vision or their thought process on them. I always told my mother, Ma, why are you feeding me with stale food? Why not your brother? Oh, he's your brother. He's a, he's a male child. Why is he a male child? Why is he so celebrated and not me? I used to ask this, right? Not, not out of malice or anything, but it's just that I'm curious, you know? So just to figure out that what can I do to get better food so that I can, you know, up my game, that sort of thing, not out of resentment. And I've always been curious that, okay, that person speaks English like that. How can I do that? Let me go and ask. I've got a lot of rejections, honestly. People didn't want to be friends with me. People didn't want to speak to me. They didn't want to sit beside me. But I was like, hey, not that my life is any great now. I can do with a few rejections. It's not that I have a reputation to keep, right? So I used to reach out to people, you know, that, hey, you know what? I think I want to learn this. Or can you help me 
just go one step ahead i'll manage and my own rest i've got rejections but it's okay to have rejections life is all about rejections right and if i would not be rejected and always be accepted i don't think i would have probably been so resilient or enjoyed my life either now i have funny stories to tell about my rejection as well so <laughs> But curiosity is so so important. I think it's always a, a you know a, a treat to talk to kids. Even my mom, she's like sixty years old. But whenever I go home, I teach her something interesting, and I come back, and she always tells my other siblings, like, look, she comes for just two three days, but she's taught me this. What have you guys taught me? Right. So she's learned English. She's learned WhatsApp. She's learned Voice YouTube. She's learned Map YouTube. Uh, Maps uh, Voice. Right. So. I mean, she's curious at this age, so I definitely feel people can be curious. They just need to get out of their, you know, belief of their victimhood and uh, see another side. There's so many takeaways that are happening for me right now, defenders, in our time with Shahina. Like, I'm thinking grit, right? Like resilience, growth mindset, curiosity. Like, there's no stopping you not just as a designer, but in life as a human, like when you can really embody those traits like Shahina has, like there's just nothing that can stop you. I'm inspired right now. Like there's a book called Rejection Proof that I really liked a lot. And you made me think of it when you're talking about how you've had rejections and we have to just accept that we are going to get rejected in this life. We're going to get rejected a lot even. And, And if we're not, then I I question whether we're doing enough. I question whether we're passionate enough if we're not getting rejected. So that's something to ask ourselves, defenders. But there's a book, it's called Rejection Proof, and it's by a fellow named Zha Zheng. I think he's Korean. He basically, I won't tell you the whole story, but he was trying to be like a Silicon Valley, like the next Silicon Valley app, trying to create it, and he just got rejected. And then he basically was in transition for from his job and he told his wife he's like you know what he's like I, I, I'm on a mission I want to spend the next hundred days getting rejected at least once every day and so he came up with I'm <laughs> this is this is true there's a book and he came up with a challenge for himself every day for a hundred days that he would go and and get it with the goal with the aim of being rejected so the book is called Rejection Proof, How I Beat Fear and Became Invincible Through 100 Days of Rejection. So one of the challenges that he did for himself, I love this one. He actually went to a stranger's house and and asked, I think this was in Texas or something, and this cowboy answers the door and he like went his, and, and asked him, the, the guy was watching the Super Bowl or something really important, but he went and interrupted his football game and asked him if he could play soccer in his backyard. <laughs> <laughs> what and like, then did he I, allow him or he said, what? yeah he said sure oh oh my god <laughs> that's super awesome <laughs> isn't that cool and another one of his challenges was he actually uh, he had a Krispy Kreme worker it was like at the Olympics day or something and he said can I have you he's like I'd like to ask you if you can make me an Olympic donut like where you, could, if you could color the the donut rings and then join them together, and the manager like stood there for a second. She's like, "I might be able to do that for you." <laughs> How cool! People are actually like joining. People are in like this doing manual. it. How like, cool! That's the thing. Yeah. Like even the most ridiculous things. Like I guess the message in that is that you can't get a yes unless you ask, unless you try to get a no. Even the, some of the things we're so afraid of, we're so afraid of people saying no. They might say yes. Yeah. And, and like this, this is a perfect example. So anyway, you just inspired me to kind of mention that book. <laughs> I have, I have it on audible. I haven't listened to it in quite a while, but it's really fun. It's, it's really, and it's inspiring in the same ways that you mentioned Shahina about how much, even the rejections you've experienced have, how far they have brought you to resilience, to grit, right? Yeah. To passion. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> What's yep. living life without passion? Yeah, and humor as well. You know, we are a bunch of humorous people. Like, we love humor. We make fun of each other. Like, for example, in rains, in monsoons, when our house used to be flooded in knee-deep gutter water, right? It's literally gutter water because we stay on top of a gutter. And we just used to tell ourselves, like, uh, guess what? Nobody would ever have a swimming pool in their own house. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you just make fun of it. You have to make fun of yourself, you of your life, and move ahead. <laughs> you have to. 
There's a reason almost all of us are connected to other humans on a social network. It's because we're all wired for connection. But unless you're a social butterfly and constant sharer, of which I am neither, it can at times feel somewhat lonely on many of these platforms. That true, genuine, personal connection can often go missing. Not only that, but you may be connected with a bunch of folks who are constantly bombarding you with cat videos and or William Hung's Hung for the Holidays Christmas album, when all you really want is a social network focused on what really matters to you. Not that Zuckerberg's Lloyd Christmas haircut at yet another round of hearings isn't entertaining. Enter User Defenders Community. Finally, a design community that has everything you love about Facebook or Twitter without Mark and Jack's constant barrage of irrelevant, intrusive ads and manipulating you with privacy violations and AI-driven algorithms that force uninteresting and irrelevant content from folks you may not even follow. UD Community is focused on one thing, UX design, and has genuinely caring empathic designers there acting as mentors and peers to help answer questions and offer guidance and inspiration on your important design journey. When you join, you get so much more than this too. You get access to early ad-free user defenders episodes. We have live exclusive expert trainings, sometimes with past guests of the show. We have a book club where we read a book and discuss it live as a group and so much more. Plus you can connect with me in a real personal way as I try to engage on every single post. So what do you wait for other than to finish that clean and jerk or pull over to the side of the road to safely join try user defenders community free for seven days at community.userdefenders.com after that it's only $9.99 a month or $99 a year defenders let's get better together because we're better together my basement was flooded once that was uh, uh that was one of my first world problems that i experienced and it, it sucked it really sucked we had just paid like $5,000 for flooring that we just got put in like maybe um, a month or two prior. We only got to enjoy the floor, the nice uh, floor for like two months. And then the, all of a sudden the water came in. We had a bunch of rains. The water came into the basement. And here I am two months later, basically like burning $5,000. And and then just, it was so painful. Every panel, every panel that I had to dig up with a crowbar, it just hurt my heart. Right, and then I the can totally week. imagine you scrubbing that floor. Like oh. it's so cool. I can. I've totally visualized that right now. <laughs> the water and the water kept coming in, so it was like a full time <laughs> job to like take the wet dry vac, suck the, as much water up as we could for that three hours, and then go and like just try to heave dump dump this thing out, and, and then go and do it again in three hours. We did that for a week. And it was a, it sucked. <laughs> it was, it hurt. That's just another example of like our, you our can trials. always tell your grandchildren that, that story, right? That your grandfather was grabbing a $500, $5,000 floor in the month. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And here's the thing. Like I said, like after hearing your story, Shahina, I feel like my problem was like just, a, it was, it's simple. It was a simple problem compared to just hearing your story. Like, I feel like, yeah, I had $5,000 to put a floor down into my finished basement, you know? Like, I had that the means to do that, and here I am, like, complaining, and of course it sucks. Of course it does. I'm not taking away from that, but, like, I think if we have the empathy and we get outside of ourselves and we actually, especially when we look at things in a global perspective, I've never been out of the country. The furthest I've been is Canada and Mexico, and I just feel like that doesn't count. <laughs> I feel like that doesn't no. count. I haven't traveled that much and I've talked to other designers who travel a lot and they tell me, every one of them tells me my empathy has increased so much from traveling and visiting other cultures, visiting other areas of the world and seeing how other people live their lives. Just some of the kids that are, are growing up in these really awful environments, like they may have more joy than a lot of the kids growing up in the United States that have everything they ever want. I totally relate to what you just said, like just looking at other people live, you know, um, just going back to my life in the slums, uh, like I just came back from home yesterday morning. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I again go back and meet my parents and they still live there. Wow. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, there are people who are even in worse conditions than us, right? So we at least have a roof, we have food in our plate, and that's happiness. That's privilege for us. Wow. And But my father always made it a point to... Um, get people who were underprivileged. So say someone who's selling some sweets around and he sleeps on a pavement near our house somewhere or on the floor somewhere. He used to call him and make him eat dinner with us. 
whatever wow. we had the, it's not like they had separate plates or sub they used to eat the same food that we eat they used to have the same glass and plate that we ate that just seeing that i still have that you know those memories in my head that this is what my father did he had you know multiple flaws but i think uh, the genesis of the empathy that i got is probably from them wow. because if they did not feel the other person's hunger or pain i don't think i would have been able to probably decipher or uh, continue with this i would have probably been a nasty kid in a slum who does not probably care or who is indifferent to other people's pain you know mm-hmm. we still give and help our neighbors like my neighbors um, kids you know they were they they poor of course but for their exams they did not have money they actually went without food for a couple of days when i heard that i was so so depressed and mm-hmm. i actually raised money for them and so that they could just eat well and give their exams and wow. it's only because my parents have continued with this journey of empathy for other people to solve their problem I think that's 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 something that we must do is be be happy and be be have an attitude of gratitude right mm. that you say my plate is full my life's really good let me go and fight another war let me go and make my life better but not dwelling in that I think in that victimhood that we live in a slum was probably the biggest learning of my life that uh, you know you're still in a much better position than a lot of people I, I want to ask you, I, I'm moved. I'm moved, Shahina. Uh, and I, I get, sometimes it gets a little dusty on the show, and this is one of those times for me. Uh, I, I, we all have a story to tell, and right? In fact, our lives are a story that only we can tell. How do we, since we know how powerful and effective storytelling is, especially in the field of design, how do we as designers like you harness our own life experiences to become better designers? For me, I think one of the things I do very often during my uh, design journey, even during my talks is use analogies, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of time jargons and um, case study and design um, words, they get so boring that people lose you somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So giving an analogy always helps because they bring an instant human connection because they have faced it somewhere else and you have faced it somewhere else. People will instantly connect with your story. And I always do that. It's I know it's funny. Sometimes uh, uh, people will be like, oh, what is she saying? This is so uh, uh, not part of this. But I think analogies are so important. Sometimes, you know, it's like a technical definition about something. Uh, but then people are like, can you give an example? And then you have to give an example of what it means so every time when i have a, a when i'm designing a screen or when i'm uh, you know talking so trying to solve a problem or working on a prd i say you know imagine yourself being in this position like how did you speak to that rickshaw driver does he understand you have to go down to his level and speak his language behave like he does and then you will be able to converse because eventually design is also a conversation with your users. It is not pixels. It is a conversation that you're having with your users. And if the language is not shared, if the eventual idea is not shared with the users, how can you converse, right? So that level of understanding between your users and you is about design, is about conversation. It's just that it's a, a, a look and feel conversation, a, uh, rather than a verbal conversation. Use analogies. I mean, it, I've said it before. I'll say it again. If it's good enough for the son of God, it's good enough for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. Parables. <laughs> I, there's a lot of parables and those are, you know, Jesus told more parables than he said, stated facts and people identified with that. And those who followed him were, it was because they connected with that story that he told and related to. So I just feel like there's so much there's that's such an important point you just made about telling stories and using analogies because people don't really care unless you are one of those just maybe edge cases that you just love to look at like a bunch of numbers and data and you just love that. And I, I'm glad you exist. Thank you for existing. <laughs> but a lot of there's a lot of people that just will not be able to resonate with the facts unless it's wrapped it won't last at least unless it's wrapped in a story that has a beginning, a middle and an end. And that resonates and that connects somebody emotionally to the data, to the facts. So I really like that a lot. And I want to throw 
something as an idea that I've actually had for quite a while. And then, and I've been doing this and I've, this is the first time I've kind of put this out there, but I feel like defenders, I feel like this will be helpful to you as well as it is for me. I created something I use, I'm an Evernote user and I love that tool a lot. I it's this podcast wouldn't even be possible without it in the same way for each of my guests. I have notes, questions. I have a, a template that I use, but I also have a note that I put in there called story bank. And what that means is basically we all, like I said earlier, we all have a unique story that only we can tell and they're defined by experiences that only we have experienced. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting we all do is we create a story bank, a note, an Evernote, put it in your Apple notes, whatever uh, cloud note you use and tell, just start thinking about stories, even from your childhood, start thinking about really unique things that have happened to you or that you've experienced and that, that just are even stories. You're just like, I could not make this up. Right. Especially stories like that. And then find a way to tie that into a takeaway. Find a way to tie that unique story into a design lesson, into an empathy lesson, into a humanity lesson. Right. Like whatever your message is, find a way to like tell your story and then tie that in. Like have an anecdote. Seth Godin calls it anecdotes. That guy is the master at this. He is the master at, at doing this, but I, uh, I'm sure he inspired me in some ways, but I just feel like that we could all, we should all do something like that, like have a story bank and then where we can tell our unique stories. It's not something we, and it's okay to tell other people's stories, but I think it's, it's more where there's more conviction when we do it ourselves. So that's my idea, Shahina. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right. I would totally agree with that. Like, in fact, the stories that I have been talking, I have somehow like the problem solving story, right? Uh, my toilet bucket story. It is a manifestation of uh, my thought process at that time. But those learnings have helped me today also, right? So how do you connect? Because see, yeah, we're not here to talk about um, a victimhood story or anything of that sort, right? We're here to talk about passionate stories, passionate stories that can make other people drive towards their passion, right? So how can you talk about your story? I'm sure people who are entitled or privileged, anything, they all have stories, right? Drunk stories, uh, dinner stories, um, school, college stories, uh, 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 fashion show stories, etc., yeah. etc. Try and see how it fits in your professional life. Because when you are vulnerable for one moment in a speech, in a talk, in a presentation, that is something that people will always remember that he or she shared his personal experience. That means you're strong enough, you're uh, so secure in yourself to be vulnerable. And it is a good quality to have because if you're not sharing your life stories, then you're just sharing a public face of yours that other people should see. But humans love to trust each other and learn to work with each other only when there is a common uh, connection, emotion, or like I said, vulnerability, because then they know that, okay, you've been a little vulnerable with them I can also be vulnerable and that's how team is built that's how trust is built hi I'm Andy Budd I'm a design agency founder I speak at conferences and I run conferences my whole purpose in life is to push design forward so I fight for the users you're listening to user defended podcast with Jason Ogle I'm going to go into what I'm calling the super six these are my superhero questions and you are a superhero Shahina like in every every manner of the word so I want to ask you, what's your design superpower? Go at it. I don't know how else to put it. I just go at it. Uh, I don't think much. I think I just take things in my hand and I try to do it. Uh, because if you put too much of thoughts into things, you'll just become a procrastinator. So for me, it's like it's in the present. Pick it up, build it, and work with it. Go at it. That's great. It's like... I feel like there's some like pugilism in there too. Just like go, go right at the fight, go right into it and just, just do it. Uh, what's your design kryptonite? I haven't really thought about it, but I think uh, my design kryptonite would be uh, impatience. Sometimes I'm very impatient. Uh, I want things to move fast, but then uh, I have to be very mindful that I'm working with 50 other people together. There are teams and teams that I collaborate with. So I have to be very mindful about other people's space as well. So impatience would be my kryptonite. Yeah, I think we can all identify <laughs> with that too. 
<laughs> right? And there's the whole move fast and break <laughs> things. We're finding that's not the best way to build products. Yeah. Um, Facebook has certainly made some errors doing that. That's like their mantra. Or that has been their mantra. I mean, they certainly have made some insensitive errors by moving fast and breaking things. So I think that like there's the balance, right? Uh, and patience, like haste makes waste is like the old uh, adage, right? And so I think there's a nice balance where we do need to keep moving. We do need to stay nimble. We do need to just launch and test, but we also need to make sure we do diligence in the yeah. midst of that. So I really identify with that one as well, Shahina. Yeah. What's your, this is a fun one. What would your UX superhero name be? Ruthless UX. That's my pseudo name. I created it a couple of years back <laughs> and it'll always be my superhero name, I think. <laughs> Ruthless UX. And that totally defines, like, that's a good title for you, especially given everything we've learned about your story. Like you certainly, you have been ruthless and it's paid off. What's one habit that contributes to your success? Being ruthless? Uh, that's definitely, <laughs> uh, that'd be repetitive. I've, uh, I've come up with something. Uh, a perseverance. <laughs> I think uh, that constant uh, and consistent pace of getting up every day, doing it, getting up every day, doing it. That discipline is so, so important because only pa passion can take you so much. Talent can take you so much, but discipline and perseverance can take you a long way in life. Jocko Willink says discipline equals freedom. I fully agree with him. He's a U.S. Marine, retired U.S. Marine, and he's, he wrote, wrote a book about leadership, which is really, really good, called Extreme Ownership. He and, and one of his fellow soldiers, they wrote this book and told some really powerful stories, but it's really just the whole core of it is about owning your crap. Like, if you, especially as a leader, and I know you've experienced as you're a design leader, you're managing a lot of folks doing some innovative work. So it's really like, I think the best leaders are the ones that own their stuff. And um, so anyway, like, I don't know why, why I started going there, but, but other than, other than like just persevering through it and, and owning it. So if you could recommend one book to our listeners, what would it be and why? One book that I really, really like, and I keep going back to is a book called Predictably Irrational by Dan O'Reilly. Um, uh, Diana Riley is actually a psychologist and uh, uh, a scientist in cons uh, uh, user behavior. And his thoughts are available on TED as well. But reason why I really like his book and his talk and in general his work is because he has an understanding of humans in a way that we sometimes don't understand ourselves. Why are humans so irrational, right? For example, that uh, if someone's driving a car and, uh, uh, you know, using his phone, has he is he trying to denote that he does not care about his life definitely not he cares about his life but why are we irrational right uh, why do we behave in certain ways that we do and when we are pointed out that you behave like this we sometimes even can't reason out that oh we did behave like this so his book is very twisted and it has a lot of examples and case studies i really really love that because it helps me in designing because psychology is an important part of our designs and uh, it does give me an insight into human behavior so yeah i really like that book i'm a recent student of psychology and i I love the pop sci genre of books. So I definitely have heard of Dan and I actually have one of his books, his other book called the honest truth about dishonesty. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I haven't read it yet, but now I really want to read. Now I want to get predictably irrational too. I've heard good things about that book as well. So now I got to get another book. How do I find time? I need a Neo Jack in my head for books. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, <laughs> right? like in the Matrix. now that I'm going to London, I'm actually pestering Dan on uh, chat, LinkedIn, everywhere. Please meet me. So he has sort of agreed. Nice. Because <laughs> I went somewhere, saw his schedule, and I was like, I saw you're free on this day. <laughs> meet me. Oh, I'm wow. Such a... <laughs> Way to go. Yeah. Way to be ruthless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here's my last question for you, Shahina. And, and I'm going to kind of reframe this question a little bit. I typically ask, what's your best advice for aspiring UX superheroes? And you can certainly answer that as well. But I really, I feel like I want to frame this a little bit differently based on everything that, that we've learned about you today and your journey, especially being, being a woman and 
really having to fight a lot of expectations or traditions. And I just want to ask you, like, what's your message for all, especially the women defenders who maybe feel repressed or maybe feel held back where they happen to be now? And then you can also also offer your advice for for everybody that's really trying to succeed in design, however you want to answer that. I think for women uh, and for young girls, I would definitely like to tell them that take risks whether risk in terms of relationships, whether risks in terms of learning, whether risk in terms of failing, just take risks. The more you take risks, the fear of losing just gets out of your way. So it's very important for women to take risk. We have been born and brought up in so much of safety, right, that we do not We've not been taught how to take risks, right? If we uh, we feel uh, very apologetic uh, if we speak out of turn, right? We'll be like, I'm sorry, but uh, can I talk about this? You know, there's a sense of apology in something that you do. Don't do that. Just just take risk. If Even if you're offending somebody, it's fine. Because you will learn by offending people, you know. You will learn by, even if people get pissed off, it's okay. The fact that you're a woman, they're any which way is pissed off. So just let it go. Just take risks in everything. Because once you take risk, your sense of taking calculated risks in the future increases. And then you build a sense of actually taking risks that are worth it. But you have to start somewhere. Uh, So powerful. If you don't mind answering the other part of that question is just what's your best advice for for designers, you new up and coming UXers who are really just trying to break in, really trying to land, maybe land their first job, maybe feel discouraged or just maybe just don't know what to learn or where to go. Like what's your best advice for these defenders listening? For the best advice for them would be be curious and be shameless. Be curious because there's enough to learn. There's always something to learn. I feel so uh, uh, inequipped, you know. I feel I there are so many better designers than me. I constantly see, how did they do that? They're so good. How can I become like them? It's not that I, I want to copy somebody, but it's just that, you know, admire someone. Admire someone so much that you want to become like them. Because somewhere you will need inspiration, you know. Have that. Be curious, you know. Be Look for inspiration. It's all around around you there's ample amount of inspiration and be shameless be shameless make mistakes you know if even if your work is bad go and show it to somebody someone will say what kind of what crap this is but it's okay at least you know it's crap then you can move to a better better version of it it will might might still be crap but after 10 10 iterations it might become better be shameless don't feel bad about it so you know uh, be curious and be shameless shahina this is this has been just rich beyond my even my already deep expectations of our time like this is this has been moving it's been filled with passion filled with fire and like i i defenders if you're not motivated right now if you're not inspired if you're not moved i'd say check your pulse You may not be alive. You may not be alive. Somebody might be putting earbuds, ear pods into a corpse. <laughs> like. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. <laughs> it's true. Oh, goodness. <laughs> now I have a weird visual in my head of like a grandfather like figure or grandmother with like with ear pods, like open <laughs> casket with like ear pods in. Oh, that's so weird. Sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. No. <laughs> What's the best way for our defenders to connect and to keep up with you? Because I know they're going to want to. Yeah, they can connect with me on uh, Twitter. My handle is Ruthless UX. Or they can just email me on ruthlessux at gmail.com. Shahina, you are a new superhero of mine. And I no doubt every defender listening right now, you are the perfect example of UX beyond the screen. Because just what you've told us, what you've shared, and, and just being so vulnerable, which is a superpower, by the way. Vulnerability is, I think, one of the greatest. And you have it in spades. Just your work in social services your legal counsel for those who can't afford it, your work in sanitation. Oh my gosh. 
Not to mention what you're doing in the actual field of design. I mean, design is all around us and you are making such a huge impact and you've inspired me so much. And no no doubt, again, I know the defenders are with me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Also, I am extremely proud of the work that you're doing. This is a very unique podcast and that is why I only reached out to you. And uh, I'm so glad that you have me on the show because I was more than just being, I was so excited to just talk to you because I heard your podcast and I was like this guy is so amazing it is so casual candid and so honest I need to just speak to him <laughs> so thank you so much for having me oh I am so, I am humbled I am humbled thank you Shahina uh, I just I just want to say like as always and especially last but not least fight on my friend One of the greatest blessings in running this show is that I get to facilitate and share origin stories and sometimes all three acts of the lives of UX superheroes. I consider myself a story catcher and I couldn't be more proud and humbled at the same time to do this here at User Defenders. Thank you for giving me the opportunity by paying your valuable attention. I do not and never will take it for granted. No matter our path, no matter our journey, we can learn and grow into the humans we are meant to be. No matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, and quite possibly not unlike Shahina, the mire and muck you've had to crawl through to get to where you are now even if you're still crawling through it you matter and you have a story to tell that only you will be able to tell a story that's significant and we and others need to hear it all starts with embracing our story yes even the painful parts of it because truth be told we would not be who we are without the painful parts we can't know the sweetness of victory without having first tasted the immense bitterness of defeat we need you We need your story. We need your contribution. We need you here to keep overcoming so you can be the hero we and your users need now more than ever. And always remember, you are not alone. We have each other. Even the greatest superheroes around needed an Avengers and a Justice League. I'll conclude this final thought with a legendary quote from Theodore Roosevelt. Because after 100 years, nobody has yet, nor quite possibly will ever, say it better. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong stumble or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strive valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spins themselves in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if they fail, at least fail while daring greatly, so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Tweet your takeaways, Defenders. I'm at User Defenders, and Shahina is at Ruthless UX, of course. We'd love to hear what you thought of the episode and engage with you around it. I want to take a second to give a quick shout-out and a, and a heartfelt thank you to two new patrons of the show. I want to start by thanking Josh Hall. Josh is actually my Nissan service rider, and he is amazing. This guy... I can't tell you the the level of customer service and care and hugs. I get hugs from this guy, you know, and anybody who knows me knows I'm a hugger. So I got to tell you, Josh is is amazing. I can't believe he did this. He just out of the blue, just uh, decided to become a patron of the show. And uh, so I just, Josh, I just thank you. If you happen to be listening, I just thank you for your support of for me and this show and also just for your incredible customer service you are a shining pillar of customer service in the world and empathy and care for your customers so thank you thank you so much my friend and thanks for your friendship and i want to also thank joel ryerson i wish i had more to say about joel because i don't know him much yet but guess what he's a ud community member now so i am excited to get to know him i know he is transitioning into product design that he let us know on the community recently and that he has just a hunger and a passion for learning everything he can about this field and to become better 
And so I love, I already love you, Joel, because you have that heart for just bettering yourself and then bettering others. That's what this is all about. So Joel, thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you for your support of user defenders. And I'm so glad you're on the community. I look forward to engaging with you more there and getting to know you more in a personal way and helping however I can and uh, learning with and from you as well. So defenders listening, I, I, I don't mention this often, probably not often enough, because I don't think many of you realize I do have a Patreon page where you can actually join up and uh, assemble with me there with your support, uh, even as little as $5 a month. And uh, there's so many cool like perks that you get from doing that. But I know, I just know in my heart, possibly because there aren't very many yet, I know that the folks who have jumped in to, to help offer tangible support to me in this show do it not because of the perks, even though they are pretty great, you can check it out. Uh, um, I'll give you the, the URL in a second. But I know that folks don't do it for that. They do it because they believe in me. They believe in what I'm doing with this show. And they've benefited greatly from this content, this free content. So I appreciate all of the patrons so much that uh, help keep this show going, help keep me going in a tangible way. And I invite you, defenders listening, if you feel compelled, no pressure at all. I understand it. It's a commitment. Even $5 a month can be a commitment. So uh, if you have the means and if you feel led to support me in the show, please feel free to do that. You can go to userdefenders.com slash Patreon. I want to thank Eli Jorgensen for the astonishing artwork, Darren Goldsmith for the sensational show notes, and just their entirely, both of these guys, their impeccable work throughout this season and previous ones as well. I am truly honored to work with you guys and your caliber of superhero and just the amazing sidekicks that you are it it humbles me and i'm honored i'm honored to work with you thank you for all your great work i want to thank the sponsors for this last half of the season and actually pork bun was a sponsor for the entire season so thank you so much pork bun and uh, thanks uci uh, their master's degree program online looks amazing so definitely check that out please support the, the sponsors of the show as well that also helps keep things going here and you can check out their offerings uh, links to their offerings at the show notes page at userdefenders.com slash zero seven zero this has been an incredible season quite possibly the best yet i know i say that every time but i mean it every time coming from a, a very introverted kind of background to getting on a mic and talking to the most inspiring designers in the world i've, I've been incredibly blessed to be able to do this so it is such a joy to do this show, and let me reframe that, that I get to do this show for an incredibly inspiring and hungry audience of defenders like you. I would say my final plea to you as we go into a long season break would be to keep growing. We're either growing or dying, and as long as we purpose in our hearts to keep growing, we will keep getting better and, and have more to offer those in need all around us. So lastly, I want to just wish you all a, an incredibly wonderful holiday break. I'm going to take one. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to be back probably till spring of 2020. I need the time. I, I need to stay married and I need to see what my kids have been up to. So, but with that, I want to wish you and yours a Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa and Happy New Year 2020. I told my dentist that 2020 would be the year of the optometrist, and it completely went over his head. So anyway, keep fighting the good fight, Defenders. It's worth it. And until next time, next year, next season, fight on, my friends.